Hey everyone, welcome back to Real Talk NFT, where we talk all things Web3. As usual, my cohort here, Brian McNutt, is joining us, and we have the pleasure of having the founder of Pixel Links here with us today, Ender Full. Thank you for joining us, Ender. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Are we interrupting you? Are you in the middle of recording like a platinum album? It seems like uh, <laughs> you're in a, produ- a, a production studio right now. Oh, dude, I wish. This is just, uh, well, I wish I was in the middle of recording a platinum album. No, um, this is just my workspace and uh, I love making music. So I have a, a, a problem with just buying loads of gear, which uh, <laughs> my wife started my actual passion for buying music equipment. And now she's sort of like at the edge of it. She's like, I <laughs> wish I never bought you your first synthesizer because I haven't stopped. <laughs> wow. Wow. So are you a producer by um, just you start as a producer or how'd you get into music? And yeah, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so I, I was born in Africa. Um, I lived in Nairobi and Kenya for about 10 years um, and grew up in a very kind of not musical family in the, ten, in the sense of my family played music, but everyone loved music. It was always in my house. Um, and yeah, I think by, by the age of 10, 11, I, I kind of got into DJing and just kind of experimenting with music on a more kind of a hands-on basis and just fell in love. Uh, I love the kind of infinite potential of music. You know, you can mm. kind of everyone using the same instruments, but had so many different ways of kind of expressing themselves. It was always something that just kind of captured my mind about instruments and music in general. And yeah, just kind of fell down the rabbit hole, loved kind of DJing, making music, sharing music, collecting. Um, and yeah, just over the years have amassed a lot of equipment, but I can't actually make music that well. Um, After all of these years in principle, um, kind of loving the experience of making music, I've never really studied it, um, which is, you know, quite a fun moment. I'm building a product right now with Dead Mouse and Richie Horton, two icons in the music industry. And it's really bringing music to the masses on a more accessible basis. Like if you don't have the technical skills, but love music and want to get closer to it, uh, we're building a product called Chorus, which gets you know music into the hands of everyone and kind of hopefully unlocks uh, the similar love for music that you know myself and, and other people who've kind of dedicated their lives to just being fans and, and creators uh, have. So yeah, that's kind of long story <laughs> version of it. But um, you know, started as a hobby and and over these years it's just become more of an obsession and uh, something that I think has just so much untapped potential as a form of, of kind of expression and connectivity. So yeah, excited to tell you more about what we're building. Yeah. With that being said, tell me a little bit about your like web three background. how did you got involved in web three blockchain and pixel link? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, I started my first business in, the, in my early twenties, I was still in university and um, I was, I was sort of just experimenting and exploring different ideas. Um, And my first venture was helping brands access youth culture. Uh, I had a lot of friends who were influential musicians or skateboarders or artists. And I was still playing a bridge between these brands who wanted to kind of come into youth culture and music and skate culture and fashion, uh, but doing it in an authentic way. Um, And so one of my first clients was a company called Lacoste, a fashion brand, a global fashion brand. And that was fun. It was kind of my first entree into like running a business. And uh, I, I took that quite far. I was, you know, in my early 20s and working with a number of different global multinational brands. Um, and music was always a key part of that experience and technology is a key part of it and help these companies understand how they would not only access youth culture, but use, you know, great technology and, uh, you know, using platforms to really push, push their messaging forward. And um, so I was 25, I believe this was maybe seven, eight years ago. And I I had applied for this competition called IMS Visionaries. It would aim to spotlight future leaders in the music industry. And uh, I basically put out this video which described what I thought the future of music would look like. And blockchain played a key role. Uh, I really believe that Web3 or blockchain rather would untangle a lot of the mess 
the music rights landscape and just create a more transparent space for music to to grow. Uh, you know, artists don't really have much transparency over the usage of their rights or how they get paid. Uh, and blockchain felt like a real solution. Um, so I was pretty young back then, like 24, 25, uh, and producing content about what I thought music would be and, and how it would grow. Uh, and, you know, over these years, I got more immersed into the potential of Web3, you know, found NFTs quite early. Uh, and I understood the technology, I guess, for many years. I understood the potential of what blockchain could do to deliver more transparency, to give people new ways to kind of control their IP. These ideas were just very kind of obvious um, because I was thinking about them from so, so young. Um, and I remember it was a couple of years later, COVID, you know, just started and kind of saw the music industry collapse, you know, it was really on its knees in many ways. Uh, artists were, you know, struggling to make a living because ultimately it was, uh, you know, the live live events industry that really drove people's careers and without touring that didn't really exist. About the same time I was thinking about gaming and the potential that gaming had as a new medium for the music industry to grow. Um, and so I, I developed a number of ideas that were just like business plans, you know, two, three years ago uh, that would kind of think about like what new music experiences could look like. You know, what could a new music game be? What could a new interactive music platform become? And it always had the same fundamentals, interactive experiences underpinned with Web3 that would allow a whole new kind of format of music to emerge that I think could be transformational um, and so I took these ideas to great people, people like Dead Mouse and Richie Horton, and they all um, saw a similar feature. You know, they've all been experimenting with the, you know, technology at the forefront of, of innovation in music and uh, are technologists as much as artists. And we just resonated with the same idea that, you know, music has more potential than is being realized. And through gaming, through the blockchain, through m multiple new technologies, we could really push music forward creating new formats of, of play and consumption that help artists earn a living, but also bring fans closer to the music than ever before. Um, and that's really been the sort of, uh, the you know, the, the kind of, it's interesting because it's, it's only looking back, right? I feel like looking back at the start of kind of, um, you know, when I was in my early 20s talking about blockchain and music and what I thought it could do for music and kind of now with a lot of other things that I've done in between, does this kind of really make sense? And, and so, yeah, I've kind of been on this journey for, I'd say about 10 years, really like launching my first business, working with brands, working with major, major artists, thinking about technology and, and kind of just, you know, bringing it all together uh, with, with a lot of great people. Um, Animoca Brands is one of our key investors. Um, they acquired a majority stake in the company. Uh, so we work closely with the Animoca Brands ecosystem and the team over there, Yat and Robbie, to also think about what new music economies could be, right? Music economies that are, are not so tied to some of the old industry structures that we know, but actually allow music to be set free in new ways. So, uh, yeah, really excited. You know, it's, uh, it's um, I think, an exciting time to work in entertainment as a whole. Uh, you know, there's yeah, tons of untapped potential for artists to, to make a living from their craft, I think. Yeah, talk of talk us through that. It's exciting, but I would think scary being an outsider with all the advent of AI and whatnot, right? Um, I, I think a two part and I've been questioned. Uh, one comment I would like to make is that NFTs have really brought me closer to art. Like I'm not a big art collector. Uh, Brian is. Brian has a ton of NFT art, and because of NFTs, I've been involved more so in art, AI generators, and whatnot. I haven't done so with music, so I find your um, product called Chorus something that could be quite interactive for myself. You know, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy the creation process. But when you talk about protecting, you know, uh, rights for music creators and, and holders, how does AI kind of, doesn't that make it a lot harder? Uh, and I know that you have a product uh, about that. So tell us, can you walk us through that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, we, we started experimenting with AI many years ago. Uh, when we just launched the company, we we're experimenting with this uh, pipeline that we built, which would take an album cover and generate a playable game, like a level essentially off the back of this album cover. And the premise was pretty simple. Uh, artists sit on all these assets that are under monetized and underutilized, like your album cover, who knew your album cover could be so much more than just an album cover for example and so i had this idea i called it artist dna and the idea was pretty simple artists have all these pieces of media 
that make up their body of work. We listen to a small portion of it and we consider that to be the artist's body of work, but technically they produce many things in the life cycle of being an artist. And so I was thinking a lot about how I could build these products and pipelines that would create new content off the back of this original material that typically is not used very much lyrics or album covers, for example, like how could we turn that into something so playful and, and interesting? So we called it artist DNA and we built a whole range of different products that, and then pipelines that would basically create new outputs from this DNA. So you, a musician could give us their stem files, their music, and we would allow fans to create new remixes from their stem files or generate a level from an album cover. And so through a lot of that experimentation two years ago, we've come to Chorus, which is uh, a music creation platform that lets you make music using licensed songs or licensed AI models uh, super easily. You can one click make a remix using mousetraps, record label songs, uh, music from a label that has tens of millions of streams. Um, and what's really fun is you also get some commercial rights to this. So not only can you come and make a song using this IP, you can also then use that piece of content in new mediums, uh, including the ability to distribute it into a traditional streaming platform, which we'll be introducing very soon. So as a fan or creator, you can come in and make music using licensed content and almost collaborate with an artist that you would never be able to collaborate with, uh, which we think is really fun, breaks down the barriers in many ways. And uh, the way we're protecting the artists is that we put their DNA on chain. So if you're coming in and you're making a new AI model with us that is powered by your STEM files or powered by your content, we have you know, basically built a business model around that that allows the artist to have full protection over the usage of their IP and can then use multiple products and choose which ones can use this IP or not. So you know, an artist will put their music into chorus and, and we give them the rails to then decide how they want to use that content. How do, do they want fans to come in and remix it and gain commercial rights? Do they just want fans to like play with it in a very closed environment? You know, we're basically giving artists full control uh, over this. And uh, yeah, it's, again, it's a journey that we started about two, two and a half years ago, thinking about this artist DNA and how we could create products that would take music IP that's typically unmonetized and create new things out of it. I think one of the most fascinating use cases cases here of NFTs is that traditionally it's very difficult and, and costly to bring music IP into a product. Really, really expensive because you have to get tons of different licenses and it's, it's just not necessarily as scalable for developers. So what we wanted to do was figure out new ways for developers to build really interesting music products without having to spend their whole budget on just licensing the content in the first place. Mm. So I think we've identified new ways for musicians to bring their IP into products that uh, kind of... Uh, uh, that was a new economy to emerge around uh, co-creation and uh, and consumption as well. Very cool. I heard you mention Dead Mouse. I actually saw a performance what two years ago, I think, at NFT NYC, which was was a lot of fun. Uh, how'd you how'd you get connected with Dead Mouse? And uh, I guess the second part to that question: How do you educate and recruit um, musicians and creators to engage with your platform? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Dead Mouse, Joel, and, and Richie Horton, who's also uh, the other co-founder, uh, they've been friends for a very long time, um, you know, and, and they have deep mutual respect for each other as, you know, creative you know, musicians, but also technologists who are always, uh, you know, like I said, using, you know, the you know technology in new ways to push the experience forward, to push their expression forward, to always kind of stay at the forefront of where creativity is going. So, um my mentor, Ben, uh, it actually manages Richie Horton. Uh, and Ben was the, uh, I would say, a key person in, in my life who really helped uh, give me a platform to kind of reach my next level. When I was 24, he actually um, was the person who owned uh, the IMS conference, the International Music Summit conference with Pete Tong. Uh, so when I was spotlighted as this future leader in music, I was 24, 25, Ben was one of my mentors. And so over the years, we worked together on many different, uh, in many different kind of contexts. And yeah, I brought the vision for Pixel Links over to, to him and said, look, I'd love to show Richie 
uh, and show Richie what we're doing with this. And, and naturally, it's like, of course, and you know, Richie liked it. And um, the suggestion was we should take it to Joel because there's no one else. There's absolutely no one else on this planet musically who has the chops to understand what's happening in gaming, what's happening in technology, and to be able to just completely dominate based on his knowledge and experience. So it was like, of course, let's take it to Joel and, and see if he has he saw the vision as well so yeah it's really cool um you know again it's one of those kind of uh over time kind of relationships that have formed and then uh the the kind of uh, small group of founders uh five of us were, were all just yeah mutual respect and they've all everyone's wanted to work together uh but never really found you know some of the right moments and opportunities so pixel links was was a great uh, great kind of moment to, for richie and joel to kind of reconnect as well yeah, I see that you guys have a very big vision, which is, you know, helping to onboard, I wouldn't say the masses onto music, but, uh, uh, you know, bring more creative usage for NFTs, Web3, all together, intertwining together. And, and where I see that, at least in my personal experiences, um, I used to do a lot of YouTube and uploading music, I would always get flagged for music that was unlicensed. And having the ability or will, having the ability, hopefully through course to maybe create with an artist that I like and everyone could get monetary value off of that. That seems, you know, like a big win for everyone. But like you said on your website, it's, it's a paradigm shift, right? Like how, like DJ Khaled got a lot of people on the, onto Snapchat because he was really famously on that. Like how do we or how are you guys onboarding people onto this new paradigm? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, there's so much that we're learning uh, in terms of what's working and what's not working. Um, you know, the idea of like fan remixes is not necessarily like so new per se, you know, and TikTok's already opened up a forum and medium for fans and just average users to, to be creators musically, to express themselves in kind of fun new ways. Um, so I think the idea of fans being creators is definitely kind of one that we're moving towards anyway. Um, but there's a lot to untangle, right? I think on the one hand, uh, there's the rights landscape. So first of all, we have to educate, you know, the artists and the labels uh, about the potential and, um, there's, again, there's a lot to just go through there in terms of m making sure that, you know, they understand the power of what Web3 can do and how it really can, un you know, give you maximum ability to transform the value of your IP while still having control and, and more. Um, so we have to educate the music industry. And then we have also, also have to educate the fans and, uh, you know, create simple rails for fans to come in. So it's a big challenge on many levels. I don't think it happens kind of overnight. Uh, for us, we are working with marquee partners uh, who we think not only have access to the audience that we want to start with. So for example, Dead Mouse and Richie Horton, collectively tens of millions of followers uh, and fans across the world. They also own all of their IP, generally speaking. Mm. So they can with their music than most can. So when we're trying to move towards this paradigm shift, we need artists who can, you know, move at a pace with us. So, you know, naturally we've started with, with great artists like Richie and Joel. Um, alongside that, we're also partnering with companies like Beatport. Beatport, for example, is one of the largest marketplaces and, and ecosystems for music. They have 40 million monthly visitors to their platform and uh, account for 10% of global downloads in the world, more than 10%, just a bit over, which is which is pretty interesting, where people still put downloading music. It's a real career for artists. And so we're starting with ecosystems where people are already consuming music, where they're still willing to spend their money on the art form and craft of music because they get it. They see value in it and this is just a new format from there we have to take a lot of our learnings and, and you know make sure that we can develop a product that is going to appeal to a broader fan base you know we want people to buy music again and to be passionate about investing into the musical experience i don't think that happens overnight it's going to be big marquee projects that you know, will continue to keep happening like a Travis Scott in Fortnite as like a moment, right? We're going to have to have many moments and everyone in the industry that wants to see this future unfold has a role to play, you know, to continue kind of driving the uh, behavior from users thinking about music as a passive listening experience into one that's more of an interactive listening experience. And so I think it's going to be great products with great moments that reimagine music in ways that, you know, people never thought about. Like imagine one of your favorite songs of all time comes out as a 
of a chorus remix that you can come and own a version for yourself that you love this track. You know, there's going to be things like that. I think that are going to capture people's imagination. And then before you know it, it's just going to be a format and every song you like is in chorus and in other similar platforms. So I think, um, I think it's a, it's a definitely, it's going to take time and, and there's many stakeholders involved with, with such a complex um, product in the music industry, right? AI, Web3, and music usually, um, you know, in the past could be quite, quite quite challenging. But I think we've we've kind of seen an inflection point recently where we, you know I think a lot of the rights holders are now kind of open, and and a lot of the products are now sort of coming to market as well, showing some real potential. So yeah, it's really exciting. Um, I wouldn't say I have the answer alone though. I think you know the best thing we can do is surround ourselves with people who know what it takes to sell out shows to millions of people, you know, week on week and sell tens of millions of records and use the knowledge that they have to speak to their fans in a way that's authentic. Like that's the only way I think long-term to get this right is, you know, it has to be told in a way that's authentic to the artist and, and to the fan. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love what you're building. I love how you're giving the power back to the creators. I mean, that's that's why we're all into NFTs and decentralization and in this whole world. And to see what you're building and what you've built, I should say, is really impressive. Um, what's the biggest challenge, uh, I guess, specifically with education of onboarding musicians or creators? Because there's a lot of NFTs are dead or, you know, a lot of talk like that or what's blockchain or they don't fully understand it because they love their art, their, what they do every day. I, I don't suspect everyone's going to be like digging deep into the blockchain like we do. So how do you, how do you approach uh, those creators and make them understand the platform? Mm, it's interesting. Um, you know, sentiment really has just changed on so many different occasions that we've kind of focused less on people that don't really get it. Like I think if there's labels and artists who don't understand what web three is going to do for their ecosystem right now, it's more like good luck, right? Like I don't understand how you're going to survive. That's not really what we're seeing on a, at least from a, you know, most people want to have the conversation, but they're, they're scared because the products in the market are not good enough for their IP. And that's just a fact. I mean, there's no point building like, uh, you know, product that has all this potential of Web3 if the artist doesn't want to put their IP in it in the first place, right? Like we have to figure, figure that out. And so it's not necessarily that the artist doesn't like NFTs. They just don't like the use case because most of the use cases don't feel like they're any different to things that they can do off chain anyway. So that's one of the first pieces that I've always seen is that artists don't hate Web3 or NFTs. They just hate the use cases that they've seen. They're generally not that exciting. I mean, gated access to a community could be groundbreaking if the artist thought like a marketer or thought like a, a different kind of business unit, I think. you know. So I do think there is value there, but for us, we've always focused on the experience and, and that's where it's, it's really interesting because we have some, you know, we have artists like uh, Jitim who just released, released a, a song on, on the chorus platform. He has a million monthly listeners on Spotify. Mm -hmm. He sold, he just sold out his latest show at jazz cafe in the UK. And you know, the conversations with him are like, he just gets it. He's like, this is the future of music. I don't need to be boxed in to think my songs are this one idea of a format that was designed before I was born. Let's define the new formats. And that too, that's like most of the artists I'm speaking to kind of think in that direction. Now, the NFTs is dead narrative is a problem. It is a problem because um, ultimately scammers and bad actors have tarnished the reputation of an industry. And we're here thinking about how this technology is going to change people's lives and create more value and equity and, uh, you know, progression, I guess, in many ways and innovation. And most people just have a, a, an association with it being you know, scams and it's a security or anything of that nature. So I think we there's a, a few things that need to be done here for this kind of sector to emerge more um, powerful over time. One, from a business level, companies need some clarity on regulation. Like it's impossible to invest into a space without knowing necessarily what you're doing and where it sits within the side, one side of the law. So you're always going to be playing a game of risk, which is business anyway. And so 
Okay, it's great to understand what level of risk you may be playing with. So I think that's one thing, just from a company side. The other element of um, kind of changing the reputation, I think, is going to just come from builders, building great products, showing use cases that get people excited, get people paid, and the technology just morphs into the background, right? Like it has to. Yeah. It just needs to morph into the background and and it let focus more on the use cases, which I think are things we know. Um, but it is a shame. I think it's it's a really interesting um, moment to exist in. You know, I'm seeing a lot of people who are very vocally telling me they're removing Web3 from their whole promise and proposition. And, you know, for us, uh, we, we believe in the technology deeply, but we understand that there's a bridge required between the future and the present. And in that, we have to figure out so much language, onboarding, uh, you know, there's so many factors that I think come into play to build a great product that takes advantage of what we see in the future, but actually delivers it to a user base that's kind of, you know, here today, not thinking about the future in the way that we kind of, you know, as a builders may get obsessed about, you know, then that's just the evolution of the tech, I think. Uh, I do believe things like the 6551 standard and, and so on, you know, that's going to unlock fun new ways for, you know, a more seamless experience that, I think is what we're kind of looking for, right? How do we give you that seamless experience whilst giving you all the potential of the technology? So big challenges. I didn't. I wouldn't say there's a single answer or solution. Um, we're still bullish as ever, um, but we understand, you know, how language plays a role in everything. Like I call it an NFT, and it's like it's a devil or we use the word AI and it could be perceived as the worst thing ever. But then actually we just give it to someone. It's like, how does it make you feel? Do you feel this is going to add to your life? Like, I love it. So humans are strangely fickle and we have to kind of also balance, you know, some of, some of those challenges as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, and you're in LA and there's so much happening within LA right now, even the, the writer's strike, anything that needs provenance, I would think that most people would gravitate like, hey, this is a very easy fix because I see this happen all the time across many social media platforms or user created content where they're, they're uh, accused of stealing um, in, uh, either music, lyric, the rights or, or the content itself. And with blockchain, you can really see who created that uh, right away you know you can have provenance of that and and you would think that the average person would be like yeah this is a great solution but to your point um, because of the economics uh, or the macro uh, narrative right now um, that that kind of benefit is uh, falling on the wayside so yeah it's interesting times but I, I'm super excited that builders like yourself you know are coming out and you guys just launched in June right uh, cr uh, correct me if I'm wrong uh, a batch of NFTs um, um, was it with course or is it with, with pixel Nix itself yeah, it was with Chorus, exactly. So we start, we did a first drop in June with actually with Mousetrap. So it was a first piece of Mousetrap DNA. And uh, we then opened the Chorus platform um, a few weeks after where if you own this DNA, you could make music using Mousetrap licensed uh, AI content. So there was a whole model that we built using with Mousetrap, the label, and you can make a song. Um, so that's cool. There's still some uh, going around on secondaries. And then we've been dropping a bunch of NFTs since then, just free drops that give you access to different AI models. Um, we have about 80,000 people signed up into the ecosystem right now. About 20,000 are active daily and growing. And that all of that is about to go on chain, which is about to be really exciting. But one of the things that I would love to see is that 50%, 50 to 60% of songs made on the platform are being minted, which is pretty crazy nice. to just start with as a benchmark because it's the final hurdle to choose to not only make the song. You can make a track with one click, but to actually then go through the process of buying it and putting it on chain opens up the next, uh, I guess, space for where the platform's about to go. Because those songs are now about to get picked up to be used as soundtracks for games. So wow, wow. there's many games in the Animoca ecosystem who are about to start picking tracks out and just making games out of these songs that fans have been creating. And there'll be a whole economy that emerges from it. Uh, it's really fun. Um, but yeah, it's been really interesting. Just the one fact around the 50 to 60% kind of mint rate really blew us away. We were not expecting that. But the fact that that music's on chain now starts to unlock some really fascinating new ways to think about music distribution. And again, just like how can those, these great songs 
find themselves into places like games where the developer may not have been able to afford to get mousetrap licensed content, but now all of a sudden has a new portfolio of content or catalog of content they can access. The fans are deeply engaged. The artists are incentivized. It's, it's going to be quite interesting to kind of um, see where that goes as well. But yeah, users are making thousands of songs a day um, and yeah, we, we will be launching um, new products, uh, yeah, new drops with, with different artists and, and collaborators pretty soon. Um, we're, we're doing something pretty fun where you can connect your PFP and get like a little personalized remix based on your PFP. Um, so that's going to be a pretty fun uh, little project. But yeah, getting some great feedback. Um, it's been really cool to see just a lot of the organic kind of growth from when we started um, a few weeks ago, um, I think about 20, 25,000 kind of users daily at the moment and, um, users are earning a soft currency called noise, uh, which is going to be a key part of, uh, how the ecosystem works as well. Um, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, just like interesting insights we're building up. We're trying to see like how people across different regions and different, uh, skill sets are engaging with the platform, you know, collectors, creators, and people kind of just coming in more, you know, kind of grinding and exploring all engaging in the ecosystem in different ways. So um, I really see a whole new kind of vision for a music economy emerging out of this. And we've got the kind of early seeds of it being planted now. This, yeah, that's extremely impressive. And that's awesome that users can go on and create music and games from Animoca brands can come on and you know, utilize that music. That's a, uh, it's a really unique way to, you know, utilize your platform and NFTs. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned noise. Uh, so it's a token on your platform. How, how do users, is it just every time you make a song or is it just signing up? How do you earn that token? Yeah. So it's not token at the point of this moment. It's sort of just a soft currency. So it's just uh, um, XP, which is being used uh, in the ecosystem, but we, we are using it to simulate a lot of behavior and just understand, you know, how users engage. Um, but that soft currency is useful uh, on many levels. Like if you earn it, you can then start to gain rewards like music prizes. There's gifts that you can get, including uh, exclusive content from people like like artists like Dead Mouse and more. So it is uh, basically gift serving, you know, access and uh, to, to rewards basically within the platform at the moment. We do have a vision for a token that we are developing towards in the future, uh, but still early stages. Um, really trying to understand, uh, you know, how we can create a, an ecosystem here that empowers the collector, the creator, the artist uh, in in fun new ways for for kind of creating. Um, but yeah, like I said, still, still early stages of, of design there. Um, but we will be bringing a lot of users who are, you know, accruing noise to help participate and shape, uh, you know, the future of how that looks. That's awesome. I, I mean, you answered a question I didn't even ask. I was going to ask, you know, how did the community, uh, what was the feedback? And you, you just gave it right there. And how is this going to shape the future? So it uh, looks like you're going to be many different iterations, of course, of, of, you know, pixel links and chorus and what you're working on. And it seems like you're ready to have that roadmap, you know, far in the future. So I'm super excited to see what comes of pixel links and, you know, how you guys disrupt the industry, because uh, I think it definitely needs disrupting and um, having you guys at the stewards of it is, is pretty cool. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting industry to play within because as is mentioned, you know, one of the biggest challenges is the rights landscape is just so limiting. And so, you know, we really have an opportunity to use Web3 and NFTs as a, uh, I think, a, a foundation that allows rights to be reimagined. And then new products can emerge like Chorus that take music rights, which we think of as the DNA of the artist. You know, they should own that DNA and build products that allow these rights to become uh, much more usable and scalable uh, using things like Chorus, which again, it's AI platform, um, but giving fans the tools to come in and take these building blocks, you know, use the artist's DNA ultimately to make new songs or make new uh, physical digital experiences. So I'm, I'm excited. I think it's a, it's a fascinating time. It's also, uh, you know, no, no challenge, I think, um, too big for, for any company, but there, yeah, a lot of, a lot of work to do. Um, and, yeah, you know, especially as we said, you know, when sentiment is so low, it's great to have, you know, platforms like yours really kind of evangelizing, you know, and pushing, uh, you know, projects forward. I think, you know, it means a lot to everyone in the space as well. So I appreciate the hard work you guys are doing. Yeah, and it speaks to the times too, because, I mean, not, not even now, but even prior, we only got, we only bring on guests that actually have 
great use cases, activations in real life, more so now than before. I'm not saying anything bad about profile pictures, or I have a lot of those collections in the background, as you can see. But the ones that are really shiny right now are the ones that you know um, allow users and creators to actually benefit from the technology. So I'm super excited for that as a community member um, to be more interactive with projects and, and brands and whatnot. So I, I'm definitely, I'm having a blast during this time because I get more engagement than before uh, with actual good projects. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, will, I wonder, will, will people move on from profile pics completely? Like I still feel like the premise of identity is so important and how profile pics kind of allow you to connect with a community and maybe even connect with yourself in a way that, you know, is, is playful and more, I think is really interesting, but does it stay for the niches or not? I feel like there is a, the gaming overlap with profile pics feels like the resurgence of, of, of where that could go. But again, that takes in space. It's definitely feel more utility driven than necessarily kind of like, speculative art per se which may you know uh, just yeah it's gonna be interesting to see what that means for the space as a, as a whole but um yeah I'm, I'm generally excited i think music has a clear use case so but you know it's really fun it's like i think with a lot of a lot of this it's it's just the convergence of a lot of these technologies that really kind of shows where it's going to go you know it's like we see one iteration of it like a few years ago with generative art and you know three four years later like okay well there's going to be so many interesting new ways to reimagine generative art with different interfaces or different experiences which take a lot of the fundamentals that made it fun but kind of bring it into new uh, creative spaces so i see the same thing for pfbs and for even music nfts that we kind of seen working and others that haven't i think everything's just going to be like you know small evolutions of 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 themselves until they kind of find uh, you know the, a clear a clear fit you know i don't i, I even believe, i believe with what we have with the chorus right now i think we're still in the early stages like we're really looking for people to come in and shape it with us like you know we we're speaking to artists daily we're speaking to community members and just like if you could take it in any direction like where you know what what, what's exciting for you? Is it being able to make your own personalized remix or do you like the idea of being a virtual artist? Because they're different paths and we're seeing a lot from users at the moment on what's really exciting them about being on the Chorus platform. Is, like, is it about getting closer to your favorite artist or, or actually becoming an artist yourself? And is there a journey here that the user uh, is kind of excited about? So yeah, I, I think um, I think like everyone, it's... it's uh, a lot of experimentation and iteration and, and working really closely with, you know, with, with the people using the product. Yeah, speaking for myself, my childhood dream was to become a Hong Kong pop star. So <laughs> I would utilize it <laughs> to create my own track list and, you know, try to make it big in, in the digital world. Um, so, but that's just me. No, nothing that deep on my end, but it, dev it definitely has my uh, wheels turning and just, you know, your entire platform. It, I mean, you definitely have a great pulse on the industry and see a fabulous, you know, vision for the future here. So I'm really excited to see how the platform performs. And, you know, you obviously have thousands and thousands of users and I only see a bright future. Yeah, it's fun, yeah. fun time. Yeah, I would uh, love everyone to come and check it out. Uh, you can go to chorus.co. Uh, which you'll, you'll see the try now link. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if you uh, drop me a DM on Twitter and mention Real Talk and we'll airdrop you some exclusive NFTs that you won't be able to get on the market. If you, uh, if you drop me a DM, I want in the full 22. I'll make sure we, we give everyone some love on, on some stuff that's on the market that you either have to buy on secondaries or stuff that's coming out, which we'll give you an early exclusive on. Um, the first will be with Beatport, as mentioned, largest marketplace for electronic music. They count for 10% of global downloads. We have a really cool drop coming up with them. So yeah, if you drop me a DM and say real talk on Twitter, uh, or just tweet me. Uh, I'll make sure we look after you guys as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, our community truly, uh, thank you for that. That's something that hasn't happened before. Some alpha drop and some um, cool NFT drops um, with Chorus. I'll make sure to put all the links down below because you have an interesting way of spelling Chorus. I think a lot of people are probably mistaken that. Um, so definitely I'll put the links down below on the the show notes and if you're watching online on the, uh, the thumbnails here. So thank you so much, Jinder, for joining us. We love having you on. I can't wait for like, you know, not even half a year to get you back on to see what the next uh, chapter brings, because I'm sure it's going to be uh, a, a lot.
Yeah, for sure. I appreciate uh, you guys having us on as well. Awesome. Thank you. Have a good day.